The future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Look around the world, and we know this to be true. You're all here in this room. Chances are the vast majority of you got in a regular gasoline-powered vehicle and drove here to the venue today. However, we know that in the future, many of us will be driving electric vehicles, clean electric vehicles. Those electric vehicles may be using power that came from dirty coal. So how clean is that electric vehicle? Well, that's also becoming a solved problem. In California today, you could use a company like Solar City to go install solar panels on your roof that look like legitimate roofing. This isn't an eyesore, it's just your entire roof is a solar panel. Pretty amazing future that's already here if you're in California today, completely off the grid. We know that today, if you go to the grocery store, the vast majority of us have this as our reality. We wait in line to check out. However, if you're lucky enough to be in Seattle near the very first Amazon Go store, there is no such thing as a line. There's no such thing as a checkout. You grab what you need and you walk out the door and sensors charge you accordingly. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And this principle, of course, applies to JavaScript as well. The future of JavaScript is here. It's not evenly distributed. And I'm going to ask you a few questions during this session that's going to make that clear with your fellow audience members. So let's get started. What I'm going to talk about is the last decade in JavaScript and three revolutions that began in the last decade, and all three of these are still in progress. Now, you might think this is a real talk through history, but in fact, what you're going to see is these three revolutions, many of you have not embraced them yet, despite the fact that they've been around for a while. I find it pretty cool that today is exactly 10 years since Jeff Atwood coined Atwood's Law, which says any application that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. Now, when Atwood said this, I thought it sounded pretty crazy. Despite being a guy that's really big into JavaScript, this sounded nuts. But today, we live in a world where that really is a reality. Uh, think about the web was the beginning of JavaScript. We all know that that's where it started. So yes, I can write web applications using JS. But today, I can write server-side apps using Node.js. I can write native mobile apps using React Native, using NativeScript, using PhoneGap, and I can even write desktop apps using things like Electron. It's crazy to me that my favorite editor today is VS Code, and that is written in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS because it uses Electron. My favorite way to communicate and share GIFs with my coworkers is Slack. That's, again, written, there's some Slack fans here, there we go. Again, that is written in plain old JavaScript using Electron. Pretty amazing. So Atwood's law has come to fruition. JavaScript, I like to say, it's a lot like Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. <laughs> but it's interesting. A lot of us are JavaScript developers not because we believe that JavaScript is the best language in the world. We are in JavaScript because of where it is, not what it is. And JavaScript continues to get better, and I love seeing the, the fact that now, every year, right around June, we get a new release of JavaScript with goodness. But I'm certainly a JavaScript developer because I can write for any platform, and that's pretty amazing. So it's a really awesome future that we have ahead with our skill sets. So anybody know what happened January 12th, 2010? This was the beginning of a, a key phase of the JavaScript revolution, the reusable JavaScript revolution. Any guesses? jQuery. Nope, jQuery was not then. It was actually earlier. No? It was, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, NPM! NPM was announced on 2010. That was the first release of NPM. Pretty big deal. Now, at the time, it didn't even make that big of a splash because we already had things like Bower that a lot of people were using. It was unclear whether, who and when people would be using NPM. But today, NPM has swallowed the world as JavaScript's de facto package manager. And this is a key piece of the reusable JavaScript revolution. If you haven't embraced NPM yet, then you're missing out on a lot of power. Now, the thing is, if you rewind just two years, this was life as a developer. This was how I was spending my time. If I, yeah, read some of the script tags, that's part of the fun. But think about the pain that we went through in 2008. 
Just 2008, it wasn't that long ago, I was dealing with all of this pain. Look at what would happen. Oh, I want to go use someone else's work in JavaScript? Well, what steps would I go through? Well, I'd do something like this. I would search the web, I'd read the docs and go install the, read the uh, relevant install steps, I'd download any relevant JavaScript and CSS, I'd set up my script tags, my style references, and then I'd write some JavaScript that targets that HTML. Then I'd realize it wouldn't work, I and mean, I'd wonder why. Didn't get a lot of help at that part. Then I'd realize that the DOM query that I wrote was wrong. That was a common mistake that I'd make in this era. And it still wouldn't work. I'd fix it, still wouldn't work. I'd realize that the script order was wrong. So I'd reorder my script tags because this needs to load before this, which loads before this. So I'd fix that, and it still wouldn't work. Then I'd read the docs some more and realize, oh, OK, I'm running the wrong version of jQuery. I found that buried down in here. I need to run at least this version. So I'd go ahead and update that. And I would repeat all of these steps to go update jQuery. There was no easy way for me to upgrade my dependencies. Once this finally worked, I would typically drink heavily. And that was my 14-step <laughs> process for working with JavaScript in 2008. Now, if you want to stay updated, imagine this. I just went through all that work to get this going. If I want to stay updated, what would I do in that case? I would repeat a lot of those steps again. Very, very painful. And what if I wanted to minify or bundle or test this code? Nope. Not going to happen. Not practical. In that era, hardly any of us were because it was just too hard. Contrast that with today. npm install lib. Import the library. npm update. That's pretty cool. That is vastly, vastly simpler. That is worth celebrating. <laughs> JavaScript doesn't have a base class library. And because of that, we're seeing npm grow at an amazing rate. npm effectively has filled in this gap. And npm's growth has been unprecedented. Unprecedented. You look at these lines here, you want to guess which one is npm? Come on, y'all. You're supposed to be the one on the top. It's kind of baiting you there. Look at this. So this number down here, this green line down here, that is .NET's package manager which is NuGet, they add 66 packages per day. How about Java's, 139 per day. NPM, almost 500 packages are added every single day to NPM. By the end of the day, another 500 things are out there. I mean, that is amazing. That's amazing unless you factor in Sturgeon's Law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a caveat with growth. We I don't want to pick on anybody, but now I, I will say I think Sturgeon was a bit of a pessimist because my take is even if Sturgeon's law is true, this is also true. I mean, more is better. 10% of that crap is good. So that's, that's a win. Yes, I know I'm a child, but this is my, this is my justification. Now, I, I, I really think this is a, a glass half full mentality uh, when you have that sort of, of view. Um, it's a bit of a first world problem kind of complaint, oh no, I can't keep up with all this awesome free stuff that people keep building for me. I mean, life as a JavaScript developer, when we talk about JavaScript fatigue, we, we sound a little, uh, <laughs> it, it's hard to, to have a lot of sympathy for us. It's a bit like going to a family reunion and complaining about how your inbox is full of recruiter emails. Oh, another recruiter wanting me to interview. It's, it's hard being a developer. Your family will hate, do not say this at a family reunion. You think you're crazy. So we're in a great place as JavaScript developers, and my point is this, that NPM allows us to write our code once and then reuse it. That's a very simple idea. So a question for the audience. We're going to go through this cadence through this talk. Question for you. How many of you are using NPM packages today? So that is probably 70% of the room. Very good. But I have a more interesting question. I was expecting the majority of you to say that you do. How about this? How many of you will say, my team has published in NPM packages, my team or my company? That's about 10, 15% of the room, although a noisy one. Woo, yes. <laughs> We're excited about this. So look at this. Everybody, put your hands back up if you have published an NPM package. And Zach, you're partying back there. That's cool. So look around the room, guys. The future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. I believe that if I came back here in a couple years, we would see the vast majority of hands up. So ask yourself, do I want to join the revolution? Because it is here. 
Now, what I want to share is a demo that shows uh, how my team works with NPM packages. My team maintains an NPM package called Fusion. The Fusion's a framework that we use for doing React development at Cox Automotive. It adds many opinions in on exactly how we want to do React development. So if I click over here, I can go to our GitHub repository, and you can see that this NPM package, of course, has a package.json. And what makes this package interesting is all the dependencies that it holds inside. Our applications have a single dependency, which is Fusion, but behind the scenes, starting here at line 27 and scrolling down, these are all the dependencies that we're actually using to put our applications to work. So developers don't have to make decisions on Webpack or Babel or what React dependencies they should be pulling in. They just leverage all of these packages, which are built into Fusion. We also include some build scripts that start the application, that configure our tests, and that perform the production build. We've also added some interesting extensions. Now behind the scenes, we're actually using Create React app, but we've added a number of opinions on top to get this done. But through the power of this single NPM package, when we deploy applications, this is the dependency that our applications take on. And in that way, when we change directions, when we need to do bug fixes or enhancements to our build process, our deployments, uh, upgrade dependencies, people have a single NPM package that they can update as necessary. So that is the key point at the end. We have at this point published at least a half dozen applications using a single NPM package that we call Fusion. So those applications, you go into the package.json, you know what you find there? One dependency. Because we've decided as a company that will bundle up all of our dependencies. Behind the scenes, it's about 75 NPM packages, a number of build scripts. All of that is contained through the power of NPM. So I'd encourage you to consider that pattern. So that was the first revolution, which is the package revolution. This is the very foundation of the reusable JavaScript revolution that I'm talking about today. So you need to have accepted that before you move on to phase two. Phase two of the reusable JavaScript revolution, I call starter kits. Or I also like to call this part du. So if you were coding back in the day, jQuery versus MooTools versus Prototype.js, which I did, there was a funny site called Vanilla.js. And you would go out to Vanilla.js and build your own custom download. You could select things like Ajax, Event System, Functions as First Class Objects, ooh, Regular Expressions, I want those, and an Array Library, that sounds handy. And then I could build a custom download of all these features in this Vanilla.js library. And when I opened it in my editor, what I would see is an empty file. Do you get the punchline? Vanilla.js is using the platform. And if you went through the Vanilla.js website, what they would do is contrast the performance of plain Vanilla.js versus using jQuery or MooTools. And they would point out Vanilla.js was, not surprisingly, faster because it removed a layer of abstraction. And this was funny at the time and caught some uh, level of attention. However, I believe that Vanilla.js is malpractice. And I believe that because today, as developers, if we're not leveraging each other's work, we are wasting time. We are reinventing the wheel. We should be standing on the shoulders of giants. And so many of us in here have done good work. See, today, here's the story. So many of us are expecting to publish an application to the web with a single minified bundle, maybe tree shaken. Maybe that bundle is split in ways so that it loads from page to page. That's not trivial. You want things like explicit dependencies. You want it to be modular, minified, transpiled, linted, tested. You want an automated build, and you want automated updates. I believe that file new project is malpractice. And in my organization, we do not do file new project. When we start from scratch, we are starting from a foundation with literally over 75 different opinions baked into it. It is a huge number of opinions that we have. Think about some of the decisions that you make if you're going to file new project right now as a JavaScript developer. You as a team need to decide what editor are we going to use and how will we standardize that configuration of tabs versus spaces, line endings, and the such. What NPM package, or I should say, what package manager are we going to use? Because NPM isn't the only one, but it's a pretty logical choice. What development web server will we use? What automation approach? What transpiler? 
What bundler? What linter? How about automated testing? We need to choose a framework, an assertion library, helper libraries, where to run our tests, when to run them, and where to place these files. We need to choose a CI server. If we're making HTTP calls, AJAX, that sort of thing, we need to choose an HTTP call approach. In fact, if I lay all this out on a slide, it's very difficult to fit it all. And here's what's interesting. You're going to watch all these decisions fly by you here. But ask yourself this. If you did a file new project, would you remember to ask yourself these questions? Would you remember all of these concerns? Because as a group in here, we know that testing is important. We know that minification and bundling and transpiling are all important as JavaScript developers. But it's really easy for a lot of these decisions to hit the floor. It's easy to accidentally end up in production in a bad state if you don't automate it away. So again, I say vanilla JavaScript today is malpractice. File new project is malpractice. Start from something more opinionated. And so what I'm driven by is a level of dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs in JavaScript. I can't get no satisfaction. So here's, here's what I'm dissatisfied with. Rework. I don't want to start from scratch when I'm starting a new project. I don't want a tedious setup just so I can get to a hello world. Wiring up, transpiling, and bundling, and minification, all of these things is really tricky. And I end up repeating mistakes. How about this? You read a blog post, and this blog post goes, oh, man, this is something I have to remember to do on my next project. But how do you remember to do that later? The way that you do that is to codify your opinions. The solution that I am suggesting here is to codify your opinions. Now, one way that you can codify your opinions is through a checklist. If you've ever read the book Checklist Manifesto, I highly recommend this to developers. It's not a technical book, but what it drives home is the benefits of writing down what you need to do. See, the Checklist Manifesto tells an interesting story about doctors. We as developers, we don't like checklists because we feel like I'm a professional. I don't need a checklist. I know what to do off the top of my head. But doctors have been found that to need a checklist. There was a study that found this. You go in, you have the nurses ask the doctors uh, the steps that they need to perform before they cut a hole in your body and run a tube into it. If they're going to run a line into you, they have to make sure that they sit down, uh, they wash their hands properly, that they make the incision properly, that they cover their hands in gloves. It's not very many steps, but as a doctor in the heat of the moment, it's really easy to forget a step. And what they found was a percentage of the time that would happen. And what happens in that case is people die. People die when you miss a step. Now, thankfully, lives generally aren't in our hands, but increasingly that is happening in software too. They saw dramatic results by creating checklists. What they saw was the 10-day line infection rate fell from 11% to zero, because how could you miss it? If you do the proper steps, people don't get infections because you have protected yourself from it. The checklist prevented 43 infections, eight deaths, and $2 million in costs. So in summary, doctors know what to do, but it's easy to overlook a step. And in the same way, we as developers also know what to do. But I showed you that slide deck. There were probably everything on that slide deck you thought, yeah, I'm generally familiar with that. But do you ask yourself those 40 questions every time you start a new JavaScript project? Have you asked yourself that about your existing project today? Probably not. So on my team, we have honored this checklist idea. We've created a file called pull request template.md. Here's a little pro tip. If you use GitHub, create a file with this name, and every time somebody creates a pull request, it will generate this within the pull request. So that way, all of our pull requests have our code review checklist right there inside of it automatically. That's us embracing the checklist manifesto so that we make sure we don't skip a step. However, you're a developer. So an even better idea than this is to automate it. Strive to automate. And I think this is a really important principle, that the more things that you can take for granted, the better off you are. Society advances as we can take things for granted. The fact that we came here today and we could take for granted that these lights would be on, that my computer would be charged up, that I could get in a car and drive here, that's really important. In the same way as developers, we need to increase the list of things that we can take for granted. See, on my team, there's a long list of things that we just don't think about anymore. My team knows that they can use the latest version of JavaScript. They know that it will just magically get transpiled. They don't have to think about it in any way. They know that every time that they hit save, the tests will run automatically. And when we push code, it will end up running on the CI server, and we'll know if any tests have failed. 
And we know in our code reviews that our code reviews go really fast now because most of the things that we look for are caught by linters instead of manually on a case-by-case -case basis. We know that when we get to production, we'll be able to use source maps to debug our code. Even though we're transpiling, we'll be able to see our original code in production. We can start our application with one command. When somebody joins my team, you clone the repository, you say npm start, and magic happens, and you're seeing your code. There's no special work there. We know that we can run a build that's minified, bundled, ready for production by just saying npm run build. And we know that to get to production, you say npm run deploy. All of this is taken for granted. And when you can take all of this stuff for granted, it's awesome because then you can focus on the hard problems and programming. See, this basics, this plumbing that we're talking about here should not be burning your cycles. It should be a solved problem for your team. And I assert this, that the more that we can take for granted, the faster we will move and the higher the quality will be on our projects. So I think of a starter kit as a living, automated, and interactive checklist. It increases the number of things that you can take for granted. Now, a lot of you may feel like, well, I kind of have a starter kit. I went out and I used Create React App from Facebook, or I used the Angular CLI, or I used Ember CLI, whatever it may be. Well, I believe that that's not enough. My recommendation to you, go find a project like that, fork it, make it your own, and then add your opinions in, because I guarantee you, your team has a number of other opinions on top of those tools. And that's precisely what my team has done. We use Create React App behind the scenes, but we have added many, many more opinions on top of it. Now, this is a really big conversation. I published a five-hour course on Pluralsight called Building a JavaScript Development Environment, where I talk through all of those 40 decisions and how you reason about those. But my recommendation to you is really simple. When you get back to your office on Monday, I would suggest this to you. Just schedule a meeting. Schedule a meeting with your team and say, I want to have an adult conversation about the issues. Let's just sit together and talk this through, and we'll come to an agreement on how we do JavaScript here at our company. <laughs> and I think it'll go well. Now, often these conversations can get heated, because TypeScript versus Babel is a big, big deal. Um, People feel very, very strongly. We, we've been through this as well, but I don't believe this. I believe if you're having those kinds of tabs versus spaces conversations on every JavaScript project, you're spending a lot of time in the wrong place. As a team, come together and agree, and then you can move forward. So I want to share another demo. I want to show you our starter kit that we use at Cox Automotive. This is my team's starter kit, which we call Fusion. The way that it works is you clone the repository just like you would any other GitHub repo. I already have it cloned over here. After you have cloned it, you run npm run setup. And setup helps you first install all the packages automatically. And after those packages are installed, then it will prompt you for the settings. It will ask you if you want to delete the Git repository. I'm just going to leave it as is here and then it will prompt you for your project name. As you can see, it enforces a logical name for a package.json. It'll ask you for whatever version you'd like to assign for the author of the project. It will ask you for your production URL. I'll just put myurl.com. Ask you for your license, the project description, just a demo. And now that we're done, our setup is complete. If I come over to package.json, then I can see that it added this information into the repository. And we have a few scripts in here to get started. The other thing that's interesting is that our starter kit has a single NPM package dependency. So we can make changes over time. And all any deployed applications need to do is pull a new version of Fusion and they get all those bug fixes or new enhancements in the future. Now, when you run our starter kit, what you will see, what you see is it starts up a demo application that says, welcome to Fusion, gives you links to important information like our list of reusable components, our style guide, and some basic steps that you can run. Once you're done looking at this demo, you can run this script to remove the demo. But we also show people how to work with the Redux app so you can go behind the scenes and see how this simple demo application works that just calculates miles per gallon. We show how our form validation story works in an interactive way. And again, you can see that many of our opinions on forms are all encapsulated within our reusable components. 
we show how our mock API works. So you can actually come into here and save your changes. And when you save those changes, you'll see that they're reflected even when you reload the page. We show how to dynamically import libraries, and we also show how to lazy load heavy React components. So you can see that this loaded after the fact. Now, once I'm done and comfortable with this demo, I can go ahead and remove it and get started coding. To do that, I come over here and say npm run remove demo. And when I do, we can see that there's a lot fewer files over here now. And if I rerun the application, now it's simply a hello world. So we have a simple starting point that is ready to run the app. So that's how we do development on my team. The nice thing is everybody knows that they start with Fusion Starter is what we've called it. One thing I will recommend is choose a brand name for whatever you do. I was recently out in San Jose consulting a team that went for the same model, and they chose their own special name. They called theirs Preamp because they have a model where they're tied to videos and they like that idea of a preamp. It went well with their branding, had their own logo and everything. Now, unfortunately, what I just showed you isn't open source, so you can't go out there and dig through it for more, but a very, very similar project that I published uh, about a year and a half ago was React Slingshot. So if you wanna dig through the code and see how all this works, check out React Slingshot. Just yesterday, it hit 7,000 stars, so I was pretty excited about that. It's, um, gotten a lot of usage. So I'm excited about this. This is an opinionated way to work with React. That said, I'm a big fan of Create React App too. It's, it's an awesome solution. So question, how many of you will say that my team or company has its own JavaScript starter kit? Wow, so that is 4%, not five, four. I'm, I'm that exact with my counting. <laughs> so that is a very, very small number. So again, look around the room. The future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. I believe that this is the future because starting with File New Project is just too much work. And your team has a large set of opinions. There are over 40 decisions that you need to make when you file new project on JavaScript today. And a starter kit operates as an automated checklist for your team so that you can codify your opinions and automate all the fatigue that people talk about away. My team is not fatigued anymore. We know when we start a project, that's what it looks like and it just works. We don't have conversations about the basics anymore. All right, so we have talked about two of the three reusable revolutions, packages and starter kits. I'm going to close out this talk with the final revolution, which is reusable components. All of these build upon one another. Now, for those that aren't familiar with reusable components, it's a reusable piece of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And we know that these are the big reasons, that we want consistency, less code, faster development, fewer bugs. The component model gives us these obvious benefits. At Facebook, they are heavily invested in the component model using React, and they find that components help hundreds of engineers work on the same code base, move between teams, quickly ramp up, and focus on products. Now, this has happened all over the world. I'm, an, I'm a car guy. I work for an automotive software company, in fact, uh, back in Kansas City. And you look at this Mercedes. This is a beautiful car, and you think, okay, these are a bunch of special parts inside. But in actuality, there's all sorts of reusable pieces, reusable components inside here. The seat belt, the button on the seat belt, the airbag systems, the transmissions, the, button, the engines themselves in many cases are used across vehicles. Really large, complicated components. And this cuts their costs, it speeds development, and it increases economies of scale. As developers, we have all this same power now. We should be working with higher and higher level abstractions with better components as time goes on. That's precisely what's happening on my team now. We've created our basic components and now we're starting to build on top of those basic building blocks. I will tell you this, I believe that the future of development is going to be assembling finished components, taking those components, putting them together in novel ways. We'll be thinking of ourselves more like working with Lego pieces rather than having to build the Legos ourselves, leverage higher pieces higher levels of abstraction. Now, I wish I could claim this slide, but I love how this slide encapsulates the mindset shift that you need to make today as a JavaScript developer. For the longest time, we've talked about separation of concerns as a separation of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. I don't believe that's a valid way to think about separation of concerns anymore, because separation of concerns today is a matter of components. So I want to separate my concern of this button from my concern of a date picker from my concern of this modal dialogue. The component is the concern we're separating. It's a powerful idea 
idea because you recognize that HTML and JavaScript were never separated concerns. We thought they were. Back in the jQuery days, I would write unobtrusive JavaScript. Here's my HTML, here's my JavaScript. The problem was if I ever changed my HTML, I broke my application if I didn't also update my JavaScript because my JavaScript was hard coded expecting a certain DOM to be there. This is the important future for JavaScript developers, is thinking about concerns in terms of reusable components. And those components may be composed of multiple technologies, but separating technologies doesn't necessarily separate concerns. HTML and JavaScript are fundamentally intertwined. Now, there's an interesting question that someone might ask you, though. If I asked you, hey, can you share this HTML with me? That's a surprisingly hard question to answer. I don't know quite how I'd respond to it. I, I, I love, I will tell you, this is the hardest thing about writing talks is getting distracted by stock photography and all the silliness that you see. You guys couldn't turn the monitor on before he pointed at it? I, yeah. But this is a hard question. Can you share this HTML with me? And the, really, the answer is we don't share raw HTML. What we share instead is JavaScript that embeds HTML. So if I want to share this div with you, the way that I'm going to get it done is with JavaScript. And this has been the case throughout history. Over the years, we've seen a lot of ways to get this done. And this brings us to the third and final revolution, which actually occurred earlier, but I'm introducing it last for a specific reason that I'll explain in a moment. Now, what happened on this date in 2006? No guesses. Web components. Nope, that was later. Gmail web app. Gmail web app. That's an interesting guess. No? Although that's, that's close. That was, that was in the ballpark. jQuery, there we go. Yes, jQuery was launched in 2006. This was a very big deal. This, this is what kept me from rage quitting web development. I was just about done with it because cross-browser was so painful. And jQuery wasn't really about components. jQuery was about paving over inconsistencies in the DOM and giving you a really elegant API. But very shortly after jQuery came about, we saw this, jQuery plugins. And jQuery plugins were really the first popular way to build reusable components for the web. However, today, you're likely not going to reach for jQuery plugins to get this done. Today, we're all asking ourselves, how should I build components? Now, I obviously have an opinion on this matter, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and share it, but, but I want to caveat why. I believe that strong opinions are useful for others. Those who are undecided or ambivalent can just adopt your stance, but those who disagree can solidify their stance by arguing against yours. So I would totally encourage you tonight, we're gonna to have an after party. I'd love for you to come up and say how I'm a dummy head and you feel like this other thing is better. That's absolutely fine. I'll share my opinion on this story right now because there is no really clear answer. Web components. The web component standard is a compelling option to consider here. Now, I'm a big fan of standardization. If you're not familiar with web components, it's this idea of four core technologies. Inert templates, put some markup in there and it just works. Custom elements, where you can define your own HTML elements. Shadow DOM, which encapsulates your styles so they don't leak out. And imports, being able to bundle HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Now, I'm a big fan of standards, and I even created a course on HTML5 web components on Pluralsight, because I was really amped about this standard. Now, the sad news is I can't stand up here and push you. You might think that that's what I'm going to tell you right now is, go ahead, go use web components. But the story really isn't that simple. There's a few reasons that I'm not reaching for web components, and many of you, how many of you are using native web components? One hand, one hand out of, I don't know how many. That's, that's definitely a less than 1%. Here's why. Spotty browser support. So you have to pull in polyfills, and those polyfills weigh a substantial amount. Uh, yesterday I just learned, uh, I believe it was 27K minified for the polyfills that you need for IE11, for instance, uh, to be able to run the standard. And that's because of browser support. See, the template tag is pretty well supported cross-browser except for IE. You'll need a polyfill there. But the other three core technologies, not so. HTML imports. A lot of red, custom elements, shadow DOM. And we have been waiting, I've literally been waiting for years for browsers to implement these standards, and we're still waiting. So the question is when. There are two other issues here. This, at the time, I was really excited about web components because it enabled some new things. The idea of the shadow DOM was really novel, that I could write simple CSS selectors and not worry about leaking onto other components. But 
today, JavaScript libraries, they keep on innovating. So in fact, like compared to React, for instance, React has answers to all these things. JSX for templates, React components are effectively your custom element. You can use CSS modules or CSS and JS to keep your styles tied to that one component. And we're all using bundlers and NPM anyway, so we don't really need the HTML import specification. So my take on it is this. Don't wait around for the web standard to catch on. Instead, just embrace modern JavaScript. The real question is, which framework? So these are the four most popular, although there are many more options out there that I'm not going to try to fit on a slide. Here's what I think you should be asking yourself, though. Four things. How stable is it? How broadly is it adopted? How much boilerplate am I putting in here that's specific to this library that's going to make it hard to shift to something else later? And how much does it weigh? So I'm a big fan of React. I'll be completely honest about that. Let's see how it scores here. In React, you do code mods. When there's a code change, a major release, I just run a code mod that automates it for me. And that's because Facebook has to do that. They are dogfooding in a way that no one else can compare to. Facebook.com, one of the biggest sites in the world, uses 30,000 React components. So Facebook can't afford to make a big breaking change that requires manual changes. They'd have to update 30,000 components. Fundamentally, React is a function that returns HTML. It is very low boilerplate. And finally, it's quite lightweight, 43K gzipped. Now, I may change my mind tomorrow, and if you go see me talking at conferences on videos from previous years, you'll find I've had different stickers on my laptop from year to year. This is how my trajectory has been through history. I was using Angular not that long ago, but now I'm enjoying React at the moment. Next year, I may be somewhere else. So you do have to ask yourself this. What if I choose X and everybody moves to Y? Whether, regardless of where you are, chances are there's going to be some other new hotness coming soon. My take on it is this. If you choose a low, boilerplate, a low boilerplate library, then you can get started safely today. Migration really is practical. See, for instance, here's React. There's really very little boilerplate. I've got to have an import at the top. I have a function with a name that takes parameters, and it returns HTML. If you told my team, hey, Corey, your team needs to go rewrite everything in Vue, we could totally do that. That's not a big deal. It's mostly a syntactic change. I don't burn the world to the ground, because really, this is what's hard. Component design is hard, but coding isn't that big of a deal. I'm convinced that my team, it would be relatively straightforward for us to move to a new technology later when React is no longer the new hotness, whatever that may be. And it may very well be us moving to standardized web components once all of the browsers have really embraced the standard. But I don't believe that you should sit around and wait, because centralized and consistent is most certainly preferable to decentralized and inconsistent. Now, that's not always true, but in the aggregate, repeating yourself through copy and paste is not a design pattern that scales very well. Now, choosing a framework is just one of many decisions that you have to consider here. I showed you something like this when you were thinking about building a starter kit. There is a similarly ridiculously long list here, and I'm just going to jump ahead so you don't have to watch it all go. 50 decisions, 50 decisions that you need to consider when you're going to create a reusable component library. So that is huge. Um, again, I went through the same thing. I just published a course, if you happen to be interested in React, called Creating Reusable React Components. This is a six-hour course. I thought that I could get it done in two, but it is a complicated conversation because there are this many decisions to consider, 50 different ones. So I want to show you quickly how we do reusable components at Cox Automotive. This is our documentation for Fusion UI components. Along the left-hand side, we have a alphabetized list of components. I'm looking at the text input component right now, which is an abstraction over a label, a text input, an error message, and add some opinions around that. Uh, down here we have a list of examples. For each of these examples, you can click on the examples header and see a snippet of code that you could copy and paste into an application. Down at the bottom, we also have a list of props, which you can change to... Oh, I apologize. I, I hit the uh, trackpad. So I, I will narrate this anyway, just to save us some time. The, the thing that I want to emphasize is, one of the harder parts is setting up your documentation. Setting it up in a way that is... Um, leveraging all your code. And what we have is all the documentation that I'm showing you here is generated from the code. We add these comments. See the comments over there on the left? It's kind of a JS doc style comment. That's what generates our documentation. So every time we hit save in the code, we see our documentation change. And that way, we don't have to worry about the two getting out of sync. I show how to get this done in uh, the Pluralsight course on React components. But really, the patterns that I follow would apply just as well as an Angular developer or a Vue developer. Don't build your docs by hand. Automate that process. 
So, final question. How many of you have your own reusable component library? More hands than I expected. This is great. That's probably 15% of the room. That's pretty cool. Excellent. How many of you are working in Angular for that reusable component library? OK. How many in React? OK. How many in Vue? Any? Wow. Lot. So Vue and React are neck and neck here. That's very different than Kansas. Well, I'll find out Kansas City next month at KCDC. We'll see how much that has shifted. I know Vue is getting a lot of attention. OK. So very, very interesting. So we just saw that again. Everybody with their hands raised. That's an interesting take. As we've gone through this progression, fewer and fewer people are through these three revolutions, because one revolution builds on another. So let's go ahead and wrap up. <laughs> I want to clarify why I laid all of this talk out in the order that I did. When you're going to build a house with components, you're going to go out and get a chimney component, a door, a window, these sorts of things. You, you want to you don't want to start from scratch and build your own window or your own door. And this should be the story now today with your uh, development story on your team. But to be able to do this, you need a foundation. A house can't float in the air. The foundation that I'm suggesting for you is a starter kit. That starter kit encapsulates all the dependencies that your team needs. And of course, that starter kit gets hosted on NPM. And that's precisely why I laid out the reusable revolution in the order that I did. So if you're one of those people that likes to take pictures of slides at conferences, here's your big chance. Just make sure your camera's not pointed at your face. First was the NPM packages, so the reusable revolution of packages. My call to you is create your first package. We just saw about 30% uh, of the room has not created an NPM package before. So that's a big first step. In fact, no, I take that back. It was more like 60% of the room had not. Starter kits. My call to you is codify your decisions. Set up a meeting on Monday to say, let's come to an agreement as a team. Here's how we do lending. Here's how we do bundling. Here's how we do transpiling, et cetera. Automate the pain away. And finally, when it comes to reusable components, go pick a library and start sharing. Set up a centralized site and start documenting your work. So if you're going to take a picture, here's your big chance right here. So hopefully, I've shared a vision that gets you as excited as I am. I come into work each day, and I'm just awesome. I am ready to go. I am amped to be a JavaScript developer. I really, life is pretty good for us right now. There's, this reusable revolution is taking off. I am Housecore on Twitter. Uh, I'd love a tweet of feedback. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>